The Pentium D, often regarded as one of Intel's worst releases of all time, where they managed to sandwich together two already pretty poor processors, and then try and sell it to people as something new. This right here might be something that some of our long term viewers will actually probably remember, because it's actually found its way into a few different systems around the channel. This is the Pentium D945, and once we get over enough of nostalgia about this dirty piece of silicon, you'll realise that it's not that great. Released in late 2006, it is probably the most common Pentium D you're going to see around. Trust me, there are others, but they all perform about the same really, with two cores and two threads clocking in at 3.4GHz, you might be able to make the mistake that this thing is actually decently powerful. Well, not really. The most powerful thing about this is that roaring 95 watt TDP, which could definitely heat things up a little bit. And that's exactly what made it so bad to use, as these things were very hot, ate through a lot of power, and, well, to get an idea behind it, really we need to find out the story behind them. So, let's rewind a little bit. See, the issue with the Pentium D is that it was set to fail from the start. Where does us know what a Pentium 4 is? Intel's attempt to push high clocks to the masses, which unfortunately in practice didn't really clock all too high without setting itself on fire, and the only thing it really ended up pushing up was your power bill. So Intel, in their infinite wisdom, decided that you know what, we'll get in on this mid-2000 craze called dual cores. And why bother with any development at all if you can just take your two existing processors and whack them together? Because that's all the Pentium D really is. See, to put this into perspective of how bad the idea was, Intel completely abandoned anything to do with the Pentium 4 or Pentium D's design, that virtually everything going forward was based off of the Pentium 3 from the 90s. Yep, Netburst really was that bad, well, at least in terms of scaling for the future, but they did however have a few good uses. For the three years they did manage to linger on the market, that is the Pentium D of course, they did sell okay. Mostly down to OEM deals, which is something Intel was very good at. A lot of OEMs actually did their best when actually accommodating for the Pentium D. Dell, Acer and Asus and a few other companies really beefed up the old power supply and cooling. And it was actually alright mostly, I mean you had two cores, you had the Intel sticker on the front and it sold alright for them because of that. But I think we all know a few OEMs where the constant power drain with some poor cooling designs really didn't give the PCs the best of the reputation. I know I've used a few HPs in the past where the best tech power supplies have actually sort of blown up. And the processor, well, it runs hot normally, but these things really were close to catching fire. Either way, it didn't exactly help because they were throttling to hell see a Pentium D end up being worse than your Pentium 4 even though you had two of them, so it was really a strange situation where some people liked them because they were actually accommodated for, but then a lot of people on the cheaper side of things had one of the worst experiences you could have on a PC during the era. Anyways, after a decent period of being beaten by AMD's proper dual-core offerings, it eventually became time to go back to the drawing board, where they based their newer series on a better foundation, the older Intel Pentium M, which in itself, as I said earlier, was based on the Intel Pentium 3. And this gave us the Core 2 Duo series, where really even the lowest spec rivaled the Pentium D, it clocked better without melting itself, it functioned as a proper dual core, and although the Core 2 quads of the era did communicate in a similar way to the Pentium D, they just worked better. All in all though, the Pentium D was really a bit of a failure from the start, but a lot of us have used it, a lot of us are still using it as they are still being used today, but how do they hold up in, well, just about everything? Before we jump right into the games, which let me tell you we've got a very modern list of titles to test, which is probably going to surprise you, that's not actually our first port of cool. I have, as usual, been using this Pentium D for quite a while to get a feel for it, which does mean I've been suffering by using it, with a PC set up next to my main computer. Anyways, I will say that the actual Windows install, which we did do, because, you know, we actually need to use this as a PC, took ages, even with an SSD. 
probably down to the CPU being pegged at 100% utilization, having to unpack folders. Really though, this is quite common in all older processors at this point. And anyways, once the OS had eventually installed and set itself up, I was actually pretty surprised. And I needed to test all the usual things I do on the PC, which you likely saw earlier. And to my surprise, I was expecting a stutter filled mess, a bit like the Pentium 4. But thankfully having two cores in the modern day does actually help the PC carry on fine. Yes, multitasking, even with the two cores, was a bit of a stretch, and really Firefox instead of any other browser was a must to actually go on the internet, but all of the programs I installed by just using the computer, I set up everything by itself, and the Pentium D very rarely dropped below 100% usage, unless you were really doing nothing, but then again, it's an older processor and we are asking it to do quite modern tasks. It was decently nippy when it came to doing most things, but as usual, most of you didn't come here to find out how well I can open up Notepad. So just how poorly does the Pentium D fare against some of 2020's largest titles? Well, modernish titles. I reckon you'll be actually quite surprised. Starting out with a game that is notoriously hard to run, well at least notoriously harder than it used to be seven years ago, with CSGO. Which, well, didn't run all too well at all with 14 FPS on average, which isn't exactly playable or competitive, and the CPU wasn't really having a fun time at all. If you run your own server and have very few people on it, you probably could see near 30 FPS. But really I need to investigate CSGO some more in terms of being an actual benchmark to actually, you know, investigate this. Either way, not a good experience, and it really goes to show that those competitive games that have a lot of people on screen, they can tax an older processor. But anyways, we've seen that run on a Pentium D before, and we've seen it not run very well before. But now we have something we haven't seen, with the Master Chief Collection, which I almost keep saying as the Master Chef Collection. And this really blew me away. Not the name change, but the fact the game actually launches, which is, well, a bit of a miracle. The game really did suffer with stuttering in large urban areas, however in corridors and in smaller locations it could hold a relatively stable, albeit unplayable, frame rate. And altogether, show that the Pentium D, although not a go-to for the game, could actually start a very recent title. Doom 2016, a well, sort of recent title, it's only four years old and a credit to itself with how well it ran, because it saw a very nearly playable frame rate for most of the time, although it could have, you know, stutters here or there which did make it virtually unplayable, but still, the Pentium D did try its best. Which is a bit of a surprise for one of Intel's worst processors ever released in a modern title, at least a decade after this processor came out. Getting a little bit older here with a not exactly recent title, but a title people like to see, is always GTA V, as it's a well optimised title and I've always found it to run quite nicely. But the thing is here, the frame rate wasn't all too bad when the game wasn't stuttering. But the processor really just couldn't load in all the data it needed to, probably to do with something with how the cores communicate over that north bridge, which is something I've noticed on a few of this era of processors, at least in terms of the world not loading in textures properly, even though the processor seems to be being utilised. And then again, you know, loading really isn't the Pentium D's strong suite, so unless you fancy driving around in a world of grey, not exactly great. Then, to round us off, I did fire up the latest in the Civilization franchise with Civilization VI. And well, I've been told there isn't much point to checking the frame rates if I'm not going to play through a full game, and I do see where people are coming from. But since I now own the title, I can run the in-game benchmark and see how long it takes to process your turns. And you know how people say you can lose a good few hours to this game? Well, try ten times longer. Processing turns was not a good thing on the Pentium D. It still did get through the benchmark, which of course surprised me because usually I expect it to crash. But then again, I wouldn't exactly call this a good experience. Now, before anyone says I didn't test any older titles in the comments section, well, we've seen this processor on the channel before, and there's plenty of videos on YouTube that show that it runs older games just fine. It's a hot, heavy lump of metal, but back in the day, it was a hot, heavy lump of metal times two. So virtually anything that will run on the Pentium 4 will run on the Pentium D, and most things that run on a low-end Core 2 Duo can just about run on the Pentium D, albeit it will struggle.
But now if you're also thinking to yourself, hey budget builds, what about X game that you didn't test? Well chances are I did probably try it, as I did try this across three different operating systems and I'll be honest there was virtually no difference at all in terms of frame rates at all, at least in terms of modern titles. The big kicker is that most games will crash, and a lot of games take so long to load that they might as well crash. I was just watching them gradually draw in resources off of the SSD and this little processor was just struggling to keep it all together. Together, which I suppose is what you'd expect from two Pentium 4s glued together. Even then, launching things was still pretty impressive, but you really did have to wait for the Pentium D to load things. Your general YouTubing, word processing and all that jazz does work very nice. I'd use some expansions to the web browser like H264ify, which of course I usually end up using, and don't even bother with any modern video codecs, they are not going to work nicely. Of course in Windows 7 and of course Linux there was little difference in this aspect. Linux was a little bit more lightweight and did help slightly, and Windows 7, well it performed about the same as Windows 10 really on a processor like this, which did surprise me, but just remember loading, because you're going to be seeing a lot of that. So there we sort of have it, the history of the Pentium D, how terrible it really was. I mean there's other areas to talk about like how Intel managed to get DRM with the Pentium D at one point, that was a fun story I read. And well frankly I'm surprised that no one's really covered it in a great deal of depth. I mean this is just sort of a little rundown about it and people that have come here expecting me to test things like Half-Life 2, well we know it runs things like that, but that wasn't the point of the video. It was more to see how the story behind one of Intel's bodged together processes as holds up and to throw some of the most intensive things we can at it because you know it was a dual core and as bad as the design was it actually performed okay back in the day provided you didn't mind the power bill that goes with it so there you have it the pentium d story i hope you've enjoyed this video good night so there we have it, I'm back for the month of February. Uh, I should be hopefully getting a video up every Saturday. I've got a few lined up nearly done, so that should be all alright. If you want to see more videos like this, do like and subscribe, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.